Hello, friend, and welcome back to another episode of the Worship Ministry Training Podcast. My name is Alex Infiedjin, your host, and I'm so stoked that you are here investing in yourself and in your leadership and in your church by learning and growing and continuing to expand your understanding of what it means to be a worship leader. A couple of things I wanted to tell you about before we get into the episode. Number one, we are now on YouTube. Well, actually, we've always been on YouTube, but we never really released video content on YouTube. But I decided to just start putting these interviews up on YouTube in an unedited format. You may or may not know this, but I spent a lot of time editing these episodes. I try to chop out anything that is unnecessary, anything that will waste your time or make the point that the speaker is trying to make less clear like what I just said, that wasn't very clear. I basically chop out anything that's unnecessary so you get the most impact in the least amount of time. But some of you probably like to be on YouTube, you like to see the guest speaking. So I, as of three months ago, began putting these episodes on YouTube in video format, completely unedited, so you just get the real raw conversation and you get to hear anything that was chopped out of the audio version of the podcast. So if you want to see the videos, you can go to youtube.com slash worship ministry training, youtube.com slash worship ministry training, and you can subscribe to YouTube as well. All right. And the second thing I want to tell you about is our brand new courses for worship leaders. Look, most worship leaders don't get any training whatsoever. They just get put in charge. And so if you struggle with bad team culture, difficult team members, maybe you don't know how to build an amazing worship set, maybe you aren't even sure what the role and goal of a worship leader is supposed to be, or maybe your church just stares blankly at you and does not engage whatsoever. If you have any of those problems, I have four brand new courses for you. You can get them at worshipministrytraining.com slash courses, and you can get 25% off the courses by entering the promo code WMT podcast at checkout that will get you 25% off. Also, if you are a worship leader in a developing country, like somewhere in Asia or Africa or the Middle East or Central America, I would love to give you these courses for free. At the bottom of the courses page, you will see in the FAQ section a little question about scholarships. Go ahead, click that, fill out the form, and I will give you the courses absolutely free free. So those are the announcements for this month's episode. In today's conversation, I'm talking with Charmaine Brown from theworshipvocalist.com, and she's going to be sharing a whole bunch of vocal tips on how you can strengthen your voice and also how you can help your singers on your team strengthen and find more confidence in their voices. So it's a great conversation. Let's dive right in with Charmaine Brown from theworshipvocalist.com. Hey, everybody. I am here with Charmaine Brown from The Worship Vocalist. Hello, Charmaine. How are you doing? Hey, hey. Good. Really good. good. Charmaine, tell us a little bit about what you do with your ministry. Sure, yeah. My husband and I started uh, The Worship Vocalist back in late 2016, and we create vocal training for worship leaders. And it's grown from one video at the start to... Many, many videos, many courses, and get to interact with worship teams, lots of worship leaders all around the world. It's awesome. I love it. Yes, you are world famous. You (laughs) actually are world famous. (laughs) I guess everybody on the internet technically is world famous. For sure. uh, But God has given you a wonderful wide reach to bless a lot of people, so we're thankful for that. And we were talking about that a little bit before we hit record, but it's an interesting and wonderful time to be alive where you can share what you know, and people can be benefited by it all over the globe. So that's awesome. Absolutely. And you you have the best and most explanatory URL, theworshipvocalist.com. <laughs> so everybody check it out. It's a beautiful website, and it explains exactly what she does. She teaches you how to be a better worship vocalist. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about singing. We're going to be talking about how to improve our own singing And then we're going to be talking about how to improve the vocalists in our ministries and help them sing with more confidence, excellence, and passion. So uh, I'd love to know, first of all, Charmaine, like what are some of the biblical principles that you lay down when you're taking on a new student or you're preparing a new video lesson? Like, why do we sing? Why should we seek to improve our voice? And really, what does God's word say about any of this singing stuff? Sure. So, I mean, the Bible refers to singing pretty much nonstop, right? There are over 400 reference to singing. It commands us to sing over Mm. 50 times. Psalms is literally, it's a book of songs, right? Mm. Um, Psalm 33 tells us to play skillfully. I think that applies to our voices as well, right? Our voice as an instrument. Mm. So, so important. And 
God cares about this stuff. Like, I really believe he cares about this stuff. The parable of the talents in Matthew 25, I I always go back to that with my students. Um, and in the, the videos that I create, the master goes on a trip and he gives the, you know, the five bags of gold, two bags of gold, one bag of gold. Mm-hmm. And we all know the story, five bag man and the two bag man go off and multiply. They double what they were given. And the one bag man just what's interesting to me is that he doesn't squander it. Like he doesn't Mm. lose it. Right. But he doesn't multiply it. He just, Mm. he doesn't do anything with it. And the master returns and is very upset with him and calls him wicked and lazy Mm -hmm. um, because he was not a good steward with what he was given. Right. So um, that to me says that we have a responsibility to be good stewards with what uh, with what God has given us, with our skills and our talents, and to not just seek to maintain, but to multiply it, mm-hmm. right? So that's what I'm always, you know, encouraging my students and my subscribers to to not just settle for, you know, the default of what your voice does, to not just settle for, yeah, you, my voice flips, it cracks, it breaks, it, Hmm. Uh, whatever, I have this amount of range. Do I think that everyone needs to improve their voice? Absolutely not. Do I believe God loves loves your voice as you worship? Yes, absolutely he does. But I'm talking about worship leaders and worship vocalists specifically. If we hmm. are leading people on stage, we have a responsibility to multiply our skill um, and our talent. And I've been reading through, as many of us do at the beginning of the year, start over at the beginning of the Bible, right? Cover to cover. And I, to be honest, in many years past, I've kind of flown through some of those early books, you know, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus. Numbers. (laughs) Yeah, really kind of quickly. And this year, these past weeks, I've really been intrigued reading, like just reading the the detail about the building of the tabernacle and mm-hmm. just so much detail. And God cares about this stuff. He cares about beauty. He cares about intricacy and it's all for his glory. Mm-hmm. And I believe that what he intends to fill with his glory, he cares that it be glorious. He cares that it be beautiful. He cares that Mm. we spend time with that. And he wants to fill our voices with his glory, right? He wants to fill our bodies as we lead worship with his glory. So yeah, so that, that's what I always go back to in, in encouraging my, uh, my students and subscribers that God cares about this stuff. It's not for our glory. It's not for our fame. It's not so that we can hit high notes or low notes or whatever. It's because he cares about us being good stewards of our instrument. Mm. That is such a great answer. And I've also been in those books too, as as I've been going through the Bible again for the new year. And I I was struck by that as well, that he wanted the skilled craftsmen to build his temple. You know, he wanted people who were skillful in their craft to build it. And, you know, it says in scripture that God inhabits the praises of his people. So in, in a sense, whenever we are leading people in worship, we're building a temple of praise and we want to build that temple skillfully, you know, so... Very interesting, very intriguing. Now, everybody has a voice, right? Yep. And so everybody's commanded to use that <laughs> voice to glorify God, just like we're called to use everything to glorify God. Why do you think the voice specifically is such a powerful tool? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, when it when it comes down to kind of just the core basic of it, singing is vibration. It is sound frequencies. There have been so many studies on how singing is so good for our health. It's so good for our well-being. It boosts our Mm. immune system. And it's a powerful thing to sing, to actually opt for our vocal cords to be vibrating, for our body to be vibrating that way. And it's also powerful to be sung over, Mm. right? It's it's all vibrations. We can't see them, but it it is happening, right? Like that's how God created. Um, I think singing, you know, the, the voice and singing in the context of, worship and congregational worship, you know, songs are powerful because they help us remember words, right? Melodies are powerful because melodies with lyrics together helps us remember the word of God, right? Worship songs. It amazes Mm -hmm. me, you know, Jason and I, my husband and I both grew up 
uh, in the church. And so, you know, we know all the the oldies, the old songs, and sometimes yes. we'll just get on these tracks where somebody will start, one of us will start singing an, an old song, and then we'll just kind of go off on this. That reminds me of that one, and we just kind of medley. And it amazes me that some of these songs I literally probably haven't thought of for 20 years, mm. 20 years. And I know every word, and I know every bit of that melody, like how— how does that work, right? Like, but it, mm-hmm. our brain has the capacity to remember things that have been put into song. Um, and our, our voice and our brain have muscle memory for that, right? So mm. yeah, it's it's a powerful thing. Yeah, that's so cool. And I've heard stories of like, you know, people with Alzheimer's and they're in bed, they can't remember anyone around them. But when you start to sing Amazing Grace, all of a sudden they come awake, they come alive. I've seen a video of it on YouTube yeah. and this guy's singing Amazing Grace every word, you know, and so you're right. It's so powerful. And I was just thinking too, like our voice is what we use to express what's in our mind and in our heart too. So I think that's why it's powerful also, because that's the only tool, like a guitar. Yeah. You can express kind of your feeling, But you can't use words with a guitar, you know, so your voice allows you to say to God and to others like what's inside of you. And so that's that's just a thought. It's it's the it's the only instrument that is it is a body instrument. It is our whole Mm -hmm. body. Right. Which is is powerful because, like you said, it it can express our innermost being. Right. We, Mm -hmm. We actually express it with our body. It comes out of us. But on the you know, on the same token, it's the most vulnerable instrument because of mm. that, right? Meaning like it's very easy for to feel vulnerable about our mm. voice. And if we, for example, get feedback from our worship pastor or whatever on our voice, that can feel like an attack against me yeah. and who yeah. I am. Whereas if I play piano and you give me some feedback on on how I play, mm. Huh. I might not like to receive that criticism, but at the same time, I go away and say, yeah, I, I need to practice that. I need to get better in that. It's not like, it's not me, yeah, right? So yeah, yeah I, I just, I know I hear from a lot of worship leaders all the time that they feel discouraged because they've been given feedback on their voice and it just feels like it's a part of them. So they feel judged, right? Yeah, no, that's such a great point. And, you know, thinking about it practically, and I wasn't planning on asking this, but, you know, I actually have a guy who sent me a video of him singing and because he's interested in serving with us. And honestly, it's just it's straight up bad. And I have no problem speaking the truth in love to people in an encouraging way, explaining, you know, why he will, won't be a good fit. But how should we. So let's say I'm the one receiving critical feedback about my voice, not the one giving it. How should I or how should that guy when he gets that feedback about his voice that's such a vulnerable thing what do you tell people how should they respond to that exhortation that encouragement that feedback that criticism Whew, it's a hard one it's a hard one because the truth is a lot of times that feedback was not necessarily spoken in love and so mm. I'm always encouraging worship pastors and, and directors to be very careful with your words as you give feedback to somebody. Because I mean, even just in my experience in my life, when I was in grade five, a girl told me that I didn't have a good voice and that mm. I, I shouldn't sing. And I don't, I don't even know what my voice sounded like back then. I don't think it was terrible. The truth was she wanted to be the only one to sing at the school um, mm. recital talent show kind of thing. And so she, she said that out of spite, right? Mm. And, but mm. it affected me so much that I didn't sing for years. Mm. Like I, wow. I literally did not open my mouth for um, years and years until I was well into my teenage years, um, my later teenage years. I literally lip synced happy birthday at birthday parties. I lip synced wow. in church because I felt so vulnerable Um, And that was a kid telling me that, but I know that's been the experience of many teenagers and adults who's, uh, you know, maybe it's their parent who said something or uh, their worship director or in response to a, 
you know, on an audition, like you're talking Mm -hmm. about or an audition video or whatever. So anyways, I know that's kind of beside the point, but I'm just always saying, you know, be very, be very mindful of your Mm -hmm. words and don't make them feel like you're writing them off forever. Give them, okay, I'd love you to work on this. Mm -hmm. I'd love you to work on this and this and this and point them towards some resources that they can use for that and tell them, feel free to to send in another video. Feel free to come back in six months and we'll talk Mm -hmm. about this again. That's so Mm -hmm. different than just, you know. You're horrible. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, hopefully nobody says that, but you you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, in receiving, in receiving uh, the, the feedback, the criticism on the other side, Ah, uh, I just think to, you got you got to take it to the Holy Spirit and just say, Holy Spirit, help me to let go of the burden of this. I don't want to. I don't want to carry that. And and anything that wasn't spoken in love, let that fall away. Right. I release that in Jesus' name. And whatever was truth, give me give me clarity. Give me wisdom about what I should be working on, on what I can be doing to improve. Because usually there is truth in mm-hmm. those things that have been yeah. said, right? So I think it should be, you know, if you've been given feedback about your voice, pick yourself up. It's hard, I know, but work on your voice because there's so much. This is the encouraging thing that I've learned as a vocal coach is that there is so much that we can do to improve our voices. Um, nobody needs to resign themselves to where your voice is at. Currently, you don't need to box yourself into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and before I ask you the next question, I just want to kind of highlight something. The enemy was you know, trying to stop or attack your area of giftedness and calling. You know, like it, imagine if, if you let that girl's words that lie reverberate in your mind forever and win, it would have stopped your calling and you wouldn't not just lead worship in your church, but equip thousands and thousands of worship leaders all over the world who are now equipping their or or leading their churches better because, because the enemy would have stopped you in your area of giftedness. So I praise God that you just rebuked that lie eventually and got over it. And um, that's, that's awesome. Now, most people that are listening have not been professionally trained in their vocals, right? And you're dealing with a lot of people coming to you saying, I want to improve, but they, they've never been trained professionally. So when dealing with us amateurs, <laughs> what are some of the common problems that you see in worship vocalists? What are the, the big areas that need work most of the time? Yeah, so I'd say most uh, worship team singers they lack confidence because their voice doesn't just doesn't do what they want it to do. Either mm. they can't hit the high notes, they can't hit the low notes, or their voice is, uh, you know, doing, you know, the, the flip, the crack right in the middle as it goes mm. over the, the break, as many people call it, the transition spot. And usually the reason is because they're either singing all in their chest voice. Do you want me to just demonstrate that sure. for people? Uh, so if they're singing all in their chest voice, they're meaning where the sound is vibrating kind of in the mouth and upper chest cavity. Uh, I could go, uh, you have no rival, you have no equal, right? So we're not hitting those higher notes on pitch because we're pushing up our chest voice to them. Mm -hmm. And the voice gets tired out, gets strained. That's a lot of, a lot of worship team singers complain that their voice is just so tired after singing on a Sunday, Mm -hmm. especially if if they have multiple services. Other singers they're okay with the high notes, but the low notes get weak. Uh, you have no rival. You have no equal. Of the name of Jesus Christ, my King. They can't get down there because they're mm-hmm. keeping the sound. It's opposite from chest voice. They're keeping their sound all up in the head cavity. Mm-hmm. Other singers use both their chest voice and their head voice, but it's going to flip. You have no rival. You have no equal right? That makes, that makes most people not want to pick up a microphone ever again, right? Mm -hmm. When that's happening. And so what I specifically train singers to do is to, to get out of the the boxes that they've sung in either only chest voice or only head voice, or using both of those and flipping in the middle and learning how to sing in a mixed voice, which is a blended tone of their chest voice, head voice, and what we call the pharyngeal, which is the middle space in the face, the ah, na, 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 nay, 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 which is, 
anybody's watched any of my videos, they've heard of, they've heard, probably heard me talk about the pharyngeal, that middle space. That's awesome. Um, because it, we, we have to do crazy exercises for it. We have, uh, nay, 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 wah, 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 But the, and I know it sounds ugly, it sounds crazy, but the beautiful thing about that sound is it's not my chest voice. And it's not my head voice. It's actually a blend of all three. So I can go, wah, 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 wah. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. And it's not flipping anymore. It's not bottoming out on the lower notes. It's not coming to a ceiling on the high notes because I've learned to blend all three. And that, when singers learn how to do that, that honestly solves most of their issues with range, pitch, tone, all the things. Man, she's good, y'all. <laughs> she's good. <laughs> you know someone's really, really, really good when they can purposefully do things badly, you know? But even when they do them badly, they still sound good doing them. Uh, so we obviously, we know you have a lot of control and experience. So uh, Thanks, man. I already have some young singers on my team, some up-and-comers that I'm going to, like, force to sign up for your courses. But... um. I, I think I'm allowed to force people to do stuff as a worship pastor. I'm not sure. But hey, anyway. well, if you pay for them, then that's... Uh... <laughs> yes, of course. We would definitely do that. So, man, that, that is so cool. So that that's really the biggest issue is the confidence that comes from being able to control your voice. And I always tell people, you don't want to be nervous on stage. So do what you have to do off stage to feel confident on stage, which means yes. lots of reps, lots of practice. You don't want to get on stage and not have control over your instrument, and in this case, your voice. And so, man, I think that's that's so cool. And I'm sure we'll get into more demonstrations uh, in a bit. I'd love to hear, because it was so, when you combined all your head voice, your chest voice, and your what, your nose voice. Pharyngeal, nose voice, yes, that's good. Yes. Pharyngeal. <laughs> Uh, that's, I'll just call it nose voice from now Sounds on. Sounds good. Because I'm, Ar I'm Armenian and we have big noses. Um, but... It was so powerful, right? It brought so much passion and power and energy when you sang that final time. I would love for you to, to help us understand the difference from like worship versus like artistic performance. And how should we think about the term performance in worship in general? Sure. I always like to encourage singers to not be afraid of artistry, to not be afraid of improving our skill and, and being able to do great things with our voice, being able to do beautiful things with our voice. Because like we were talking about earlier, I think God cares about these things. I think he loves beauty. He loves artistry because that's who he is. He's a beautiful God. He's a glorious God. And when our voice can do beautiful things, that's, that's actually a reflection of his glory and his beauty. Right. Um, so, Yes, I'm not against the word performance per se. I mean, at the, you know, mm -hmm. the definition, I don't know the exact definition of it, but basically just, you know, doing doing a task, right? Like executing yeah. a, a task or duty mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so I don't think singers should be afraid of improving our skill. I think a lot of singers are because they equate that with pride. They equate, um, you know, doing great things with your voice with like, no, that's too showy. That should never be on a church stage. From my perspective, I think it's totally okay to be artistic with our voice, but we have to remember that our primary goal is to lead our congregations <clears throat> without distraction. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, in the same way as, uh, you know, off pitch notes are a distraction. An unpleasant sounding tone is a distraction. A, you know, a harmony and a, and a lead vocal that are clashing with each other, that's distracting to a congregation being led in worship. Too much down the road of unique artistry, too many licks and trills and runs and embellishments, too, um, you know, phrasing that's really, really unique and artistic. Some of those things, that to me is a distraction to leading our congregation mm -hmm. in worship. So mm -hmm. I think there's a line, there's a balance that we have to find, if that makes sense. And I think it comes down to our heart. And I think as worship leaders, we have to be constantly examining our heart and saying, uh, you know, am I doing this 
because I want God to get the glory, because my voice is a reflection of, of His glory and His beauty, or am I doing this because I want some of that glory, right? You know, I can choose a, a high key for a song because my voice goes up to that high note and I can embellish it and I can do a, a big lick on that high note. I can do a big ad lib all for God's glory and because my voice can do it and I've trained my voice and I I just, I love to give him glory or I can do that because I secretly, I, I want people to think, wow, look at what her voice can do. And those are, those are two completely different stories, right? Mm, yeah, that's so good. Cause you're addressing in that answer, the heart side of it, which anybody can try to grab glory, but our heart should always be to serve people and point them to Jesus. But also you're addressing the technical side of like, yes, you can do a run, but as, don't let it distract from people being able to engage with the Lord. Like it should only add. And it's a balance, like you said, and it takes some some practice to figure out how much is too much. In one of my courses, and this is not a like a plug or anything, but like I do talk about what it means to sing simply. We want to sing simply because we want to give the congregation a track to follow. Like it's easy yes. for them to da, 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 follow along. But we also want to add the embellishments that do evoke more emotion and more passion. And, you know, there's different ways to do that, like embellishing the end of a note so that, you know, there are, they've already sung the note and you're embellishing the end of it and other things like that. So Absolutely. you can check out the, you can check out the courses later, but, and you should definitely check out Charmaine's courses because <laughs> they're way better than mine. No. Um, okay. So yes, they are. <laughs> I already know for a fact. Um, but let's talk about this. What are some things that we can do? We'll talk about our own voice and then we'll, we'll move into a time of talking about our, our singers on our team's voices, sure. but let's first talk about ours. What can we do to improve and strengthen our voice, like easy mm -hmm. to do, often overlooked things. What are some things we should be doing to improve and strengthen our voices? Yeah. So first of all, warming up on Sunday mornings, that to me is that that's a non-negotiable for all worship team singers should be doing it. I hear a lot of people say, well, I've never warmed up and my voice works just fine on a Sunday morning. Okay. But it might not work long-term. Honestly, it, mm. I've, I've known so many worship leaders, worship pastors who they didn't take care of their instrument. They didn't take care of their voice. And uh, they thought it was all working fine. They thought it was, you know, maybe my voice just gets a little bit tired after a Sunday. But then all of a sudden, their voice just gives out on them. And they have to, some have had to get vocal surgery to remove nodules. Uh, wow. Some have to, you know, go on rest, vocal rest for a few months, which you know, for most of us, we need our voice for our job. So it's, it's, it's not realistic mm -hmm. to be having to take months of, you know, months right. of vocal rest. So uh, having a good warm up, I've got a, a warm up that people can download the worship vocalist.com slash free warm up. Nice. Um, we've got a, a, a video where I teach about the importance of warming up, how to warm up, and then a, a downloadable audio warm up one for guys. I'll one put for that girls. link in the show notes, free sure. warm up. Yeah. 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 Uh, Worshipbooklist.com slash free warm up. Uh, so warming up the voice that that's the most important thing people can do just for, cause it's, it's not where most of us, we sing on Sunday mornings. That's not easy on the voice. Singing early in the morning is not easy on the voice. So we have to take mm -hmm. extra care of our instrument. Uh, but beyond that, to actually improve our voices is training our voice with vocal exercises, doing some of the stuff that I was talking about before. So we've got three resonators, chest, head, and pharyngeal. Chest voice resonates in the mouth. Ah, so doing exercises like yeah, 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 that work out and specifically work out, isolate that part of our voice. A uh, head voice res resonates in the upper nasal cavity and uh, head cavity. Wee, go, 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 go. doing exercises that specifically isolate that, uh, mm. work on that. And then the pharyngeal, which is right in the middle of the two. It's where the sound is buzzing. Air is buzzing right in the middle of the face. <laughs> Things like that. I've got all that mm. stuff in my courses. So working on these different resonators, these different parts of the voice 
is Mm -hmm. training the voice to know where to sit, training the resonance to Mm -hmm. know where to sit. It's training the vocal cords to be in the most efficient coordinations for every note uh, that we sing, for every volume that we sing so we can have different, you know, dynamics in our songs. So I recommend singers work out their voice three to five times a week. Voice Mm. works very similarly to other muscles in our body. Our our muscles, God designed them to respond to exercise. So when we, if you go to the gym consistently and you're eating right and, you know, doing all the things, Mm -hmm. you can expect your body to go through a transformation. You can expect Mm -hmm. your muscles to get stronger and respond to that. If you work out your voice using strategic exercises, there's no way that your voice will not improve and strengthen and be able to hit higher notes and lower notes and be able to mix uh, resonators like I was talking about to get that powerful contemporary sound. So warming Mm up, working out the voice, those are, I'd say, the two two big things. The biggies. Yeah. Yeah. Pray and read your Bible. It's always always back to the basics, right? (laughs) Exactly. Now, what about learning to find your own style or your own tone, like by listening to other singers and mimicking them or like, what would you say about some of that stuff? Yeah, I think, I think uh, learning to, you know, listening to other singers, learning to mimic people. I think that's a really important part of our, our journey as a singer. Some people think, oh no, I I don't want to mimic other singers. I I just want to find my own unique style. But actually the the listening and and forming our opinions and and even trying things out in our voice to see what can my voice do? What kind of comes naturally to me? What doesn't come naturally Mm -hmm. to me? um, I think that's really important. I think that our end goal should never be I want to sound exactly like Kim Walker. I want to sound exactly like Carrie Joe. I don't think that's a healthy perspective to have, but you know, I can say I'd love to have power in my voice like Kim does. I'd love to be able to hit those high notes like Carrie does. Like kind of picking different things mm-hmm. and, and strengths of singers that we love to listen to and love to mimic and, and saying, I, I'd love that. I want to train my voice to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. They are Kim Walker Smith and Carrie Joe. You are you. Be you. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Uh, that, that's good. So let's switch now to our ministries, to our people that they sing background vocals or or they lead a song or two. Talk to us about the difference between lead vocals and background vocals. So I like to say everybody on stage is leading. Every, everybody on stage is a worship leader. And I, I like everybody to think of themselves as that, because if you start to think of yourself as secondary in the background, not as important, you're not going to lead with your stage presence. You're, you're not going to lead with your body. You're not going to lead with your facial expressions nearly as much as if you, you know, view yourself, I think all musicians and singers, we're all worship leaders on stage, but in terms of worship leader voice, background vocal voice. I mean, it's right there in the name, background, vocal. When I'm the worship leader, I I do try to stand out. I do lead confidently and passionately. And I will, you know, I will use my unique tone and, and style and phrasing as I lead. When I'm the background vocalist, I need to get in the back seat, right? Um, and actually not use my unique tone and style and phrasing and vibrato, but aim to blend in with the worship leader. So we always, as, as background vocalists, we always have to be listening very, very intently to the worship mm-hmm. leader's voice because everybody has different voices, right? So, um, and even this resonance stuff I was talking about, that is what makes every singer's tone sound different from one another. Mm-hmm. Somebody like we were talking about Kim Walker Smith, hers is a more chest dominant mixed voice tone. Whereas Carrie mm-hmm. Job is a more head voice dominant mixed voice tone, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. And so if I were singing background vocalists, you know, in different sets behind either of them, I would make my voice sound very different behind them. Mm -hmm. Behind Kim, Mm -hmm. I would sound more chest dominant with my harmonies, right? I would get that fuller tone. Behind Carrie Job, I would lighten it up a bit more. I would allow more head voice into my tone so that I can 
blend in so that my voice doesn't stand out. Mm. Um, so that's tonally. Um, other things like phrasing, we, we have to be listening to when are they coming into their words? When are they coming off of their words? Not using a lot of S's and hard consonants as background vocalists, you know, sometimes not even fully forming the ends of our words. Because mm-hmm. if we have too many singers singing the da 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 that can be distracting. Mm-hmm. Vibrato, you know, singing generally background vocalists singing with less vibrato because when we have multiple vocalists singing ah, with a lot of vibrato, right. that can clash. So yeah, just aiming to blend in mm. and and match or kind of stay under the tone phrasing volume. Uh, I of, love that. Yeah, I love I love that. You know. The point you made about the consonants is one that's often overlooked. Background vocalists shouldn't be harsh or hard on their consonants. You really barely put out the T's and the S's and the K's and all that, right? Exactly. Uh, but that's something that not a lot of people think about. Um, but that's a huge one. And I always just tell my singers, tone and timing, you know, match the tone and the timing. Um, but you, you said all that very well. Now, what about building a song as a background vocalist, you know, my worship leader is leading a song. When should I come in? What should I sing? How do I build a song dynamically? You know, we don't want people singing the whole time, um, but we also don't want them only coming in on like the chorus. So how do you teach background singers to know how to build a song? Maybe their worship leader doesn't give them much direction. So how should they approach that? Right. I would love for this to become more of the culture of teams to be talking about this stuff. And if your worship leader doesn't give you direction, ask. And and if they say, I don't care, sing whenever you want, then yes, we do have certain principles that are good to put into play. But um, I, I wish that more worship teams and more vocal teams would talk through this kind of stuff because it is very important. But I always like to think of, you know, where are the biggest points in the song. Where do we want to build to dynamically? So usually that's going to be, you know, sometimes the second chorus gets quite big, but definitely the if the bridge repeats, those later bridge repeats, the final choruses are going to be those big places. So that's where you want, you know, the most volume, the most people singing, uh, and the most harmonies. Mm-hmm. And all the other sections of the song, we have to think about how we're going to build to that so that it creates this dynamic song journey. So usually I recommend the first verse being a solo. Uh, I don't, people can react to the word solo. It's not a solo sure. for a performance, uh, but meaning just one person singing, mainly because that gives the most amount of room to grow, right? If you mm-hmm. start with multiple or even two vocalists singing, You've already, you've taken away that first level that you could have started with. So start with one single vocalist. um, And then in a first chorus, it depends on if it's a more upbeat song or a slower song. If it's a more upbeat song, you might have everybody come in or a couple people come Mm -hmm. in singing unison. Um, If it's a slower song, you might have that solo vocal continue until verse Mm -hmm. two, maybe adding one harmony there. Verse two, either maybe two vocalists, you might have them singing unison. You might have one singing harmony, maybe Mm -hmm. everybody on unison, but again, saving room for that next chorus. We're looking to add a layer kind of each Mm -hmm. time. If there's three part harmony, I like to save that for the end of the song. A lot of teams will bring that in like right away in the first chorus. I think Mm -hmm. that should be saved for like bridge repeats and final choruses and just Mm -hmm. stick with, you know, there's nothing wrong with having multiple singers singing melody. I think that actually creates such strength for the congregation mm-hmm. to follow, to mm-hmm. have multiple singers on melody and a couple people singing the same harmony. I think that yeah. can be, be really good. Yeah, that's so good. I think if we error, we error on the side of doing the harmonies, all three harmonies too early. I still think we're, we're it's not like we're super off point. Like it's still mostly following what you're laying out here. But I I do know sometimes I'll do by the first chorus, I'll be singing the the harmony underneath someone. And I I should probably just save that till the third chorus, you know, or till the bridge, 
or like sometimes in verse two, we'll have a lead and then a top harmony. And then I'll come in like halfway through verse two with like the bottom harmony right before the second chorus, you know? And that's another thing too, is people can do is they can just uh, harmonize certain phrases of words or like bring the harmony in as like the transitional point between the verse and the chorus and those types of things. So um, yeah, that's all really good. Now, real quick though, about harmony, you know, I know a lot of worship leaders who, when they're not leading a song, if someone else on their team is leading, they don't know how to sing harmony. So they just don't sing at all, which then it's kind of a wasted microphone. It's a wasted, you know, empty spot, um, sure. that could be used more beautifully. How do you teach people to hear harmony for the worship leaders listening who can't sing harmony, but want to learn so that they can add that extra? Um, for sure. how do you teach people to hear harmonies? Totally. Um, and I just, I just want to say something that will relate to both this question and the the last question that I think all singers should sing all the time, just not into their microphone. When we're talking yes, about, amen. when we're talking about, you know, a solo vocal in the first verse and maybe adding one vocal on, you know, the chorus, and maybe you have five or six singers on stage. I think all of those singers should be singing all the time, just with your microphone down. So yes. let me just, Amen. I just, I just want to clarify that um, because that, that and is the band where, and the band and the band should be singing. Yes. All the musicians. I, I, think so. I, I think so. I think it really, it adds to the culture in the room of this is a corporate, everybody sings experience. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay. So yes. Okay, harmony. So, so yeah. Learning harmony. Okay. So harmony is a lot like learning a, a foreign language, right? Like if, if you or I wanted to learn a new language, we could go out and do that. We could get resources and we could learn how to do that. And the reason why we can learn a foreign language is because it all sounds like gibberish when you don't know it. But when you actually take time to learn it, you realize, oh, it makes sense. Those sounds actually, they make sense when you break them down and you learn, first you learn the building blocks, the very basic things in that language, and then you you learn how to put them together and, and you can get more complex with it. And it all makes sense to our brain, right? The language is not random. And so similar with harmony, it's not random. It boils down to basic math and science and math makes sense to our brain, right? Like harmonious notes, the reason why those notes harmonize with each other is because they're, everything is vibrations, everything is frequencies. It's because those uh, notes have frequencies that they line up with each other. They, they divide into each other with simple ratios, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to those, those two frequencies don't divide into each other with simple ratios. So they don't, sound harmonious mm -hmm. to our ears. Mm -hmm. So if we want to learn harmonies, we have to learn the basic building blocks of harmony, which is intervals, right? So especially, you know, in most contemporary worship songs, uh, the, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and learning, th those make sense to our ears when we can learn that. So I like to teach singers, I have a course on harmony on my site, to train your ear to hear Learn it using easy songs. Remember, oh, when the saints, here comes the bride. There's that fourth, twinkle, twinkle. And there's my fifth, learning those, and there, there's other intervals we can learn, but learning those basic intervals, training your hear to hear those quickly and becoming just really comfortable with those. And then you'll start to, to hear them in in songs, right? You'll, you'll be able to start adding them above and below. Um, so it, it's same as math. It comes more easily for some people. Some people can just pick things up like this. Uh, some people, it takes a little bit more time, especially if you mm -hmm. didn't grow up, you know, hearing a lot of harmonies and singing a lot of harmonies, you didn't learn it naturally, but it can absolutely be learned. You just have to break it down to the, the simple components. Yeah. And then the last thing I like to tell people to learn is like, when you listen to songs from now on, only listen to the harmonies and like, totally. just try to hear it over and over and over and over and over. And it'll soon it'll start to make sense to your brain. Just like you said, a foreign language does yeah. with repetition. So yeah, absolutely. You know, as we begin wrapping it up, like you said, I wish more worship ministries had a culture of 
taking their vocals seriously. So what are some things that you've seen churches do that have really brought the best out of their vocal teams, whether it's, you know, something that you encourage vocal directors or worship leaders to do at their churches or something you've seen at another church? What are the best practices to bring the best out of our singers? I think that we, we have to set our singers up for success in as many ways as we can. I mean, we, if we set each you know, individual singer up for success, we're setting our team up for success. And there are a lot of ways we can do this. One is, uh, you know, we were talking about the how to build a song dynamically. Don't leave that up to each individual singer to decide. I think I think it's great when we can, um, as the worship leader or worship director or whoever you want to make in charge of that, actually creating a song layout for each song. And, and this is what I do when I'm worship leading. I actually send this out in an email, put it on planning center for my singers. I say, I'm, I'm going to solo lead this first verse. And then I want Brittany to come in and, and sing a lower harmony with me, just really nice and light on that first chorus. Mm-hmm. Um, then I want all the singers to come in. We're going to sing in unison here. I want to do this, dun, 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 go all through the song. Um, laying out, you know, is that in like an Excel spreadsheet or like what's the format? Uh, Is it just a a text message or usually, yeah, usually just a, just a, not, not like a spreadsheet or anything. I just usually in an email or just on a, like a PDF kind of thing. I'd love to, I mean, do you have the, like, is it on the lyrics sheet? Like, is there a, no, I haven't, I haven't done it on, I haven't done it on the lyrics. I've just kind of written it out. Tell them what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I think you could get as complex as you want to, but the truth is most vocalists aren't used to getting any direction at all. (laughs) So (laughs) uh, just kind of easing them into it. So having a plan and communicating that plan, Mm. um, reminding them of that. um, And, and don't be afraid to be detailed, right? Like it helps people prepare, yeah, so so setting them up for success with that. Also setting our singers up for success by knowing their voice and giving them, if, if we're assigning songs for a person to lead or if we're assigning a key for a person to lead in, setting them up for success by knowing what their voice does best and putting them in their sweet spot, right? Like if, mm-hmm. if a singer's, you know, maybe they haven't trained their voice to sing super high yet and you give them a song that's out of their range they're Mm -hmm. not going to have a lot of confidence in leading right like put Mm -hmm. them put them in their sweet spot put them where their voice performs best and then thirdly and kind of off of that give them resources that can help them get to the next Mm -hmm. level give them feedback i think I think having a culture of feedback is a really important mm-hmm. thing. If you just do it once in a while and it's only criticism, then that's mm-hmm. that doesn't help people a lot. But I know teams who uh, it's just it's a part of their culture to, you know, every weekend after the service, yeah. all the vocalists get feedback. You know, I touch base with each of the vocalists and say, loved when you did this. Lo- that was awesome. This was great. Loved mm-hmm. that transition. Loved your ad libs there. Um, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd love you to work on your pitch, especially in this song or when you get into that higher range or your voice is flipping into head voice there. I'd love to do some workouts working out your higher range. Like give mm-hmm. them specific things that they can be working on and point them to resources that can help them do that. That's so good. So many gold nuggets so far (laughs) in this episode. Now, what about uh, like vocal rehearsals? I I know Mm -hmm. some churches, they'll send the vocalist to the back while the band works out the parts on stage. Have you seen that work? And if so, what are some best practices there? Yeah, I I haven't been a part of a lot of, you know, I, I grew up at the same church for my dad's a pastor 25 years and I've been going to the, you know, the church we've been attending just for the past three years. So I've I've only experienced kind of two things myself. Mm-hmm. I've heard of what other people do, but I grew up with the the band and vocalists separating off at the mm-hmm. beginning of rehearsal. I think that's super effective. I I recommend that. Um, for much of that time, actually, I played backup keys in the band. Mm-hmm. So actually, for me. It, this was in the era of the backup keys played the trumpet parts. Okay. Mm-hmm. So 
<laughs> but at our church, at our church, it was the vocalists in the church basement and the band on stage. And it was me and the trumpet player practicing like the trumpet parts for like the shout of the king is among us, like Hilarious. old Hillsong songs. Uh, but then I did start singing on the team and our our vocalists would do like 45 minutes in the uh, separately. We do a vocal warm up. It's great if you can get your vocalists, encourage them to warm up before they come to rehearsal. But a lot of people I find if it's a weeknight, they're coming rushed maybe from work or from supper. So taking 10 or 15 minutes to do a vocal warm up and and, mm-hmm. and together, and then you can kind of make sure people are kind of hitting on these different points in their voice, even use it as a teaching moment. Mm-hmm. And then spending some time going through the different harmony parts and and talking again through the the song layouts and stuff, I think that works super well. Yeah. Well, as the the listeners can hear and maybe see if we put this on YouTube, uh, (laughs) you you have so much wisdom and knowledge in this area. And so I'd love for you to tell them like, where can they find you? Where can they get these courses and what, you know, what do they get? What do you offer? And uh, just where can they keep up with you online? Sure. Well, uh, you can check out our YouTube channel, Worship Vocalist. Uh, got lots of uh, free stuff there. I do uh, song tutorials from from time to time. That's how most people kind of stumble across my stuff because they're, nice. uh, you know, just searching YouTube for how to sing What a Beautiful Name or how to sing Battle right. of the Longs or whatever. And then they stumble across a song tutorial that um, I've done, um, but then our site, the worship vocalist.com, I've got, uh, four main courses on there, discover your voice, which is a, a six week kind of working on the foundational things in your voice, working on some of these things we've talked about, chest voice, head voice, pharyngeal voice, mixed voice, learning to, uh, get that contemporary sound, mm-hmm. um, master your voice is a, a 30 lesson, course that builds on Discover Your Voice and and really works at mastering that contemporary mixed tone and gets into things, stylistic things, vibrato, uh, how to embellish, phrasing, all that kind of stuff, finding your unique tone. Got a vocal Mm -hmm. health course, taking care of your voice, uh, harmony essentials for worship course, which does all the things that we talked about, like learning intervals, learning those building blocks, learning how to apply them to songs um yeah and and for each lesson there's the i've got a video lesson and then uh an audio workout that you can do i recommend three to five times a week you can just follow nice. along it's got the the scale so you can just there's no excuse the demonstrations i've got jason my husband did all the suckered him into doing the male demonstrations for me nice. so that guys can hear kind of how it should sound in their voice and yeah so the worship yeah, so much good stuff. And guys, please check it out. I would say, don't you even offer like bundles for like multiple, like if a worship leader wants to have six of his singers go through that, they can get like ah. six. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I so, would encourage vocalists to, or worship leaders to buy it for their church, for their team. What do you, Is that possible? Yeah, for sure. So we've got, you can sign up as an individual. We've got a, a monthly and yearly rate. So you can sign it, you can choose from that. Um, but then we've got, team subscriptions you can for for a lot less of a price than buying them you know for each of the individuals on your team you can get like up to up to five people six to ten people uh 10 to 25 however however big your team is you can choose that that's so good so everybody go to the worship and and sign up today i know you've been talking for a long time and you need to take a sip of water but do you have any (laughs) final words for our listeners oh yeah, I think I said this before, but just don't box yourself into where your voice is at. Don't be discouraged. I know a lot of singers, especially these days that, uh, you know, a lot of churches have gone online and it's been a really discouraging thing for a lot of singers to, you know, if if you're doing live stream or you're doing pre-recorded sets or whatever, um, a lot of singers have not really taken the time to, or not not taken the time, but they've never really heard their voice much before, except just singing live in the room. And it can be really discouraging and a really weird, strange thing to hear your mm-hmm. voice back, you know, over the, mm-hmm. the live stream. Um, and I just a lot of singers just uh, have told me they just they feel like quitting, they feel like giving up because their voice is it. They don't like the way that it sounds. 
Um, but don't box yourself into that. Don't resign yourself to, um, you know, I only have a small amount of range. I can't hit high notes. I can't sing this song. I can't do this or that because mm. uh, I've seen it in my own voice. I think this is probably one of my biggest strengths as a coach is that I didn't grow up singing. I didn't grow up wanting to be a singer or a worship leader or, um, you know, have any big desires. I didn't go to school for music. Uh, like, and when I did start singing, um, was because my my youth young adults pastor kind of pushed me into it a little bit. But when I did start singing, I had a very weak voice. It did not do what I wanted to, wanted it to do. I I don't have a lot of natural talent. I know a lot of singers who have a lot of natural talent. I am not one of them. I have built my voice from the ground up. And that's mm. why I know it can be done because I didn't start with a lot. I didn't start with being able to um, do a lot of this stuff with my voice. I worked on the basics. I worked on the foundations and have seen incredible things in my own voice and in my students' voices. So I know it can be done for you. We believe. Woo-hoo. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you so much <laughs> for welcome. your time and your wisdom. I know you've helped a lot, a lot of worship leaders. And hopefully, worship leaders, I'm going to tell you, send this episode to your singers. Please send it to your singers. Help them improve, okay? Awesome. Thanks, Charmaine, for your time. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Alex. All right, that's it for this month's episode. I hope you were helped by it. If you were, please help us by sending it to every singer you know. Anyone who sings, send them this episode. Tell them, hey, you really should listen to this. Also, be sure to check out the courses to help you be a confident, excellent, and successful worship leader by going to worshipministrytraining.com slash courses and entering the promo code WMT podcast at checkout to get 25% off. All right, God bless you guys. I will see you next month for another helpful episode. See ya. Thank you.